Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to this second anniversary celebration of the Web Accessibility Directive. Uh, we still have people coming in, entering the room, so I'll just wait a couple of more minutes to let everyone wake up in North America and, and join us. So people are still coming in, but I think we can uh, maybe start already now. It's a couple of minutes past nine and we have a really a packed agenda. So welcome everyone. Um, this is the second time we have the anniversary of the Web Accessibility Directive. Uh, and this is something that the IAAP EU organized together with the European Disability Forum. Uh, and first of all, a little bit of housekeeping and accessibility information. As usual, we offer international sign, as well as live captions in English and automatic translations into several European languages. And today I'm extra proud that we also have Theresias Masaryk University, who again has generously offered to live caption also this event in Czech. So, fantastic. Um, and you can use the interpretation option in Zoom to get to, get to the Czech translations. So if I could ask uh, Rachel to please add the links uh, for the automatic translations in the chat. Um, vous pouvez lire les sous-titres en français si vous suivez le lien fourni dans le chat. Sie können das auf Deutsch lesen, wenn Sie dem in chat angegebenen Link folgen. Puedes leer el, el español si sigues el enlace provisto en el chat. Du kan läsa texten på svenska om du klickar på länken som vi lägger i chatten. And now I will ask my dear friend Radek to support me with the Czech part of this translation because I still haven't learned your beautiful language. Dobré ráno všem, ti, kdo chcete sledovat stopu se simultánním tlumočením do češtiny, tak na panelu s ovládacími prvky najdete tlačítko Interpretation. Je to takový ten globus pro ty z vás, kdo pracujete s rozhraním vizuálně. Potvrďte jej a z nabízených jazyků si vyberte Czech pro češtinu. Děkuju a přeju. Uh, That's wow. all, Susanna. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it will take time before I learn that. So thank you, Radik, for supporting me. You are so welcome. As, as usual, we will monitor the chat for general dialogue and technical issues. And I have my uh, support team from the US uh, with me today. So thank you for waking up early to, to do this. And also for any questions you may have for speakers or, uh, or panelists, then please use the Q&A section. Um, um, every session will have room for answering questions at the end, and uh, we would like this to be in kind of an interactive event, so please do use the opportunity to ask anything about accessibility, European legislation policy, or IAAP, or anything else you would like to ask, and we'll make sure we can at least try to answer as many questions as, as possible. So we are excited to see more than 600 registered participants from more than 60 countries uh, who want to celebrate the Web Accessibility Directive with us today. And accessibility in the EU is obviously of great interest far beyond our continent. And I think that is why we don't see 600 uh, live participants here because we actually have participants from all over the globe and some of them are still asleep, I'm sure. Uh, and we'll probably look at the recording afterwards. But for every one of you who is here live today, especially welcome to you. At the EU level, uh, IAAP has been focusing on digital accessibility. And as we kind of restarted after the pandemic, of course, the Web Accessibility Directive has been top of mind, not only for us, but for most people. Um, but we are, together with our ambitious and very successful local chapters in Germany, Austria, and German-speaking parts of Switzerland, which is called the DACH chapter, and Denmark, Finland, Norway, Sweden, grouped together in the Nordic chapter, as well as the UK chapter, um, increasingly adding attention to the European Accessibility Act and the updated requirements that follow with the upcoming legislation. So today, we are going to use the Web Accessibility Directive anniversary to discuss the state of the art 
experience from all relevant stakeholders and also look into what comes next. We have a packed agenda, as I said, and a long list of brilliant speakers and panelists, so we really need to get going. But before we let June Lowry Kingston of the European Commission make the introductory remarks, I want to stress how happy and proud I am that IWP EU and the European Disability Forum can organize these EU fo focused events free of charge for our members, for EDF members, and for non members, for everyone. And this is made possible by our sponsors. And I would really like to thank uh, Site Improve and Crawford Technologies and also the uh, Teresias uh, University for the captioning, but for really making this possible. And uh, therefore, I would also like to give the floor to our main sponsor, uh, Site Improve, represented by Jennifer Chadwick. And she is actually based in Canada, and it must be really, really early in the morning for you. So thank you for joining us. And I hope that you would like to share with us a little bit of the reflections that you have got from your EU-based teams. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Susanna and everyone. And yeah, very, very happy to be here. So um, it is a pleasure to speak on behalf of my colleagues uh, in the EU, uh, Denmark and Finland, who are not able to attend today and, uh, as, as you said, share the reflections uh, they had uh, on the impact uh, that the directive has had over the past two years. Uh, so from Canada, uh, in the past year or so, I've also had the opportunity to support them in their work uh, in delivering uh, web development services, role-based training and education. Uh, to meet at the directive, so I too have been following this impact, and so far so much so that I'm I'm awake now and uh, and happy happy to be here. So um, before it was in place, um, my colleagues feel or felt that uh, digital accessibility was a low priority to organizations, uh, without much visibility into the needs of people with disabilities. Um, so it's their own personal experiences that has informed their perception of how things were before the directive uh, was implemented. And uh, now as professionals, they see that positive impact, um, not only on their work with organizations, but as citizens in Europe to, to their own lives. So um, their thoughts, inevitably the, the directive has drawn attention to these needs. And uh, two outcomes that they have seen are, um, Firstly, it's helped organizations understand how citizens actually use digital properties every day uh, and that compatibility with existing assistive technologies, uh, whether it be hardware or software um, or lack thereof. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do. So by requiring to meet legislative measurements such as that, uh, organizations have matured in their knowledge and have taken action to create this, this compatibility, which was not present before. So. Certainly, there's, there are various levels of, of commitment uh, and even full understanding of end users' needs uh, still there, um, but what they feel is that awareness is higher than, than ever before. Um, secondly, uh, companies that provide web and product development services, uh, such as, as they have in the past, uh, now they've been able to uh, now they've been employed to make these these properties accessible uh, for organizations, have acquired new skills and then apply those to multiple projects. Um, now that all EU member states must have tra transposed the act into national law, and by June 2025, companies must ensure that you know products and services are covered uh, covered by the act are accessible. We we all know this, and I'm I'm learning as I go. So my colleagues' hope is that businesses continue to recognize the benefits of inclusive design by attracting people with disabilities as consumers. Um, and with the directive at play, there'll be increased demand for those skilled service providers uh, that have that experience in those early projects uh, to move about. So, um, and lastly, um, in order for the directive to continue to impact people with disabilities as the end users, uh, most critically, uh, professionals who build and apply knowledge uh, and these skills need to share this with other people and other practitioners in the space. So this is critical, uh, given that accessibility training, they, they feel is still not a, a standard component in academic programs for design, marketing, business administration in the EU, uh, EU and much the same in Canada as well. So what I want, we want to say is this is where the IAAP plays such a significant role uh, in providing professionals with these best practice resources, guidance, certifications uh, to those designers, developers, 
content authors and marketing specialists, um, as well as procurement officers as we move forward. So we are, we're proud members um, and, and partners with the, within the uh, IAAP and G3ICT for this and other reasons, but um, we, I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to share those reflections. Um, and yeah, in the chat perhaps, um, or, or any, any time, we're just curious to see how experts who are speaking today on the panels or anyone in the audience, if if you align with, um, they're looking to see if, if you align with their, where their view. So thank you, Susanna, I'll, I'll turn it back. Thank you, <clears throat> Jennifer. So it's good to hear that your team is um, feeling that the directive has, has an impact uh, one way or another. And I think we will uh, hear more about that today and maybe pros and cons and, and so on, but, but really nice to, to have your reflections on this. So now it's time for the introduction from the European Commission. So DG Connect, uh, which is the part of the uh, commission <clears throat> responsible for the directive, uh, they have an internal event today. So, but June Lowry Kingston, who is the head of unit for accessibility, multilingualism and safer internet, the DG Connect, uh, has kindly spent part of her weekend recording a video message for us to set the scene. So Malcolm, if you could please um, show the video. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends of accessibility, it's my great pleasure to welcome you, virtually, alas, but still warmly, to today's event to mark the second anniversary of the European Union's Web Accessibility Directive. Now, anyone familiar with European legislation knows that there are lots of dates involved. The date of adoption, the date of signature, date of publication, of entry into force, well, the 23rd of September 2020 marked the effective deadline for making the websites of all the public sector bodies across the Union accessible to persons with disabilities, according to common accessibility requirements. The past two years, indeed the past 12 months, have seen considerable progress on digital accessibility across the Union, as both we, the European Commission, and the 27 EU member states have been very active on this front. Last summer, mobile apps fell in scope of the directive. And by the end of 2021, the member states had to monitor their websites and mobile applications for accessibility and report on the results to the commission. We, the commission, had to review the application of the directive, that is, its implementation, and the findings of that review will soon be published. The review included an analysis of the first set of member states' reports and both public and targeted consultations of a wide range of contacts and stakeholders. For the first time in those public consultations, the Commission used an easy to read questionnaire available in all 24 official languages and about 80% of the respondents with disabilities replied to this format. In total, we received around 1,000 replies from over 30 countries. The Commission knows how important accessibility is as a precondition of human rights, but also to ensure equality and non-discrimination for everyone in the digital environment that nowadays plays such, such an essential part of our daily lives. I'm happy to say that while much still remains to be done, the WAD is starting to achieve its objectives. Main success factors that emerged from our review were the introduction of the feedback and enforcement mechanisms in each member state, the implementation of accessibility statements saying what is and is not accessible and how to find or access alternate versions of information, and the arrangements for regular monitoring and reporting. Some of the main findings of the study are the following. On the positive side, we note that thanks to the WAD, the Web Accessibility Directive, several member states introduced legislation about digital accessibility for the very first time. The directive, and especially the accompanying harmonized European standard, has had a positive effect on cross-border web accessibility services, reducing fragmentation, and so improving harmonization in this sector of the single market. 
The level of accessibility of online public sector information has improved over the last three years, though more so at national level than for regional or local web level websites. And the directive is coherent internally and shows no overlaps or inconsistencies with other EU policies or laws related to accessibility. The member states did not report or raise issues about accessibility related costs, implying that the cost benefit in all member states has been seen as positive and that costs do not constitute a major barrier. And last but not least, all the member states have transposed the law and all have made or have enhanced their efforts to en enhance accessibility, thanks to the directive. But because accessibility is a process, it's not a question of flicking a switch. The review has also highlighted areas for improvement. The comparability of the monitoring results from the member states is limited because of the flexibility on this embedded in the monitoring methodology and the reporting criteria set in the directive. The feedback and the enforcement mechanisms in the member states have not yet reached their full potential. And there is a shortage of digital accessibility expertise in both the public and the private sector, which makes it challenging for public sector bodies to procure accessible solutions or to recruit accessibility experts. And that's why the work to increase qualifications, such as those offered by the IAAP, is so necessary and so important. One of the most striking achievements that we have witnessed over the last few years is the genuine cooperation between the member states and the thriving community that has grown up around the formal expert group for the member states that we have the pleasure of facilitating. Public sector accessibility experts work closely together. They exchange practices and ideas and tools and best practice and questions, and they join forces through cross-border collaboration, sharing contracts and consultancy services and recommendations. The Union's commitment to online accessibility continues with the European Accessibility Act, which will enter into effective force in 2025. This piece of legislation builds on the directive, but it extends the scope of accessibility to a wider range of key digital services and tools. So it's evident that accessibility is no longer, if it ever was, a nice to have feature. The global culture in the public sector in Europe is shifting towards inclusivity by default. The public information and services that are now being developed must be correct, secure for personal data and accessible to all users' profiles. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Mr Gerard Quinn, visited the Union in March this year and he said, to quote, I'm most impressed with the substantial body of legislation and proposed legislation on accessibility, web accessibility, the proposed Digital Services Act, the proposed regulation of artificial intelligence and so on. Cumulatively, this makes the European Union a natural leader of sorts in these fields. The Commission will continue its efforts towards achieving the goal, a union of equality. As our President Ursula von der Leyen said, a union where everyone can enjoy the same rights and opportunities, where we are all equal with all our differences, a continent where we can finally be united in diversity. I wish you a fruitful discussion today and hope that all our efforts to raise awareness of the needs and opportunities of web accessibility and the need for more web accessibility experts will soon bear fruit. Thank you. So I, I feel that I should thank her, but, but that I can't do that when she's not here. But um, uh, I think we need to move on to live speakers now. So we are extremely happy about the support and the commitment by the commission. Uh, and they are, of course, well, let's say important for policy and legislation. But the real experts, the key players in our community are, in my view, at least people with disabilities. And therefore, I'm very happy to give the floor to our co-organizer of this event, the European Disability Forum, represented today by one and only Alejandro Moledo, who is Deputy Director and Head of Policy at EDF. Good morning, everyone. 
and first of all, many thanks to IWP. Uh, we are very proud to, to have you as members of the European Disability Forum and having these, uh, these events with you to celebrate the Web Accessibility Directive. I would start by saying, for those who don't know EDF, that we are the umbrella organization representing persons with disabilities at European level. Basically, we are an organization of organization representing the full diversity of the disability movement in Europe, those European NGOs representing different disability groups, such as the European Blind Union, European Union of the Deaf, Inclusion Europe, Autism Europe, and so forth, and those organizations at national level representing the disability community in every member state and beyond. So, as I said, um, I'm particularly, I'm personally very glad to, to be part of this event and to celebrate the second anniversary of the Web Accessibility Directive, which was indeed uh, one of the first uh, legislation uh, on digital accessibility that paved the way to the recent progress that um, June from the Commission was referring to in the past years. Then we had improvements in media accessibility, in electronic communications, and most recently in the horizontal and very long awaited legislation, the European Accessibility Act, which is very much aligned with the requirements as for digital accessibility of the Web Accessibility Directive, whereas the Web Directive focuses on the public sector, the Accessibility Act covers uh, certain um, private services as well. And um, it's great to celebrate the, um, the second anniversary of the, of the Web Directive, but of course, there is still a long way to go as for digital accessibility in, in Europe. And it's not just, um, and I believe it will be discussed in following uh, panels, it's not just um, the full compliance um, on, on websites that can claim to be absolutely accessible, is that we see that still there is a huge gap for websites that actually are not fit for purpose for persons with disabilities. Uh, when we started reviewing ourselves with our members, um, the impact of the web directive uh, in 2020, we asked um, uh, self-advocates and experts uh, whether the, the, um, the, they could access and achieve what they wanted to achieve or get the information they wanted to achieve in public sector websites. And unfortunately, 80% of them uh, told us that it was not possible. Uh, some progress has been made as for accessibility, but unfortunately, there are there were always barriers preventing achieving the goal that you pursue when you access a public website, which is to maybe to access a public service, to get information or to, uh, to perform a task such as, you know, submitting your tax declaration, for example. So we see also that um, in a recent commission, uh, European Commission study uh, called uh, e-government benchmark 2022 that only 16 percent of websites currently meet selected accessibility criteria so we do see this impact of the web directive is progressing but unfortunately the progress has not been as quick as we uh, we would have liked and we we would expect so it has not improved unfortunately at the same pace as other um, other uh, important aspects of, uh, of ICT development, such as privacy or, um, or security, for example. And it has not improved at the same pace as digitalization has, uh, has entered in, into our lives. Uh, it will be mentioned that it has already the, the impact of the pandemic and many public sector suddenly turned uh, fully digital because of the circumstances and our life became even more um, dependent on those uh, websites and those mobile applications to access crucial uh, public services during the pandemic. So where well, we see this uh, impetus for improving digital, um, digital services and the digital government, we don't see the same impetus as for ensuring digital inclusion. So this should definitely become or remain as high priority of the European Commission and all member states, basically to, uh, to ensure that those 
um, processes uh, uh, going in parallel, digitalization and all what comes with it, uh, security, privacy and so forth, come along with uh, accessibility for persons with disabilities, which in the end, as we all know, and the, uh, particularly the accessibility experts, improve the uh, user experience of all users, of all citizens. So we look very much forward to seeing the conclusions of the evaluation of the web directive that uh, Yun was mentioning. Uh, we're still um, waiting for actually two countries uh, to submit uh, their reports. France and Cyprus are uh, a bit late in this process. But in the in this uh, during this evaluation, um, we saw that um, the Commission implemented a very uh, successful uh, a more inclusive way on, of consulting through their public consultations um, method, which was the provision of an easy to read uh, version of this um, of this public um, consultation. And it's in itself, this is a really good example that we would like to highlight as the commission is also a public sector uh, website, even though it's not covered by the web accessibility directive. This consultation did fit its purpose because it it reach out to persons with disabilities in a way that was more accessible than the regular way of providing um, your input to the to the European Commission. This e e easy to read version uh, was actually uh, used by more than twice, uh, more than twice as many uh, people as um, the let's say regular um, regular um, respondents, and it showed that. Obviously, um, people with intellectual disabilities use this version, but again, it was also very much used by uh, many people with disabilities because the process itself was accessible, was more accessible to provide their um, their thoughts and ideas as for the web directive. So this is a uh, a good example that showed the the the, the importance of uh, understanding what's the purpose and making it as inclusive as as possible. So um, I would like also to mention that when we um, uh, responded uh, the public consultation EDF, um, we highlighted some of the shortcomings that we see in the um, in the legislation, and 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 we would like to see uh, to see fix. Um, in the in the short summary that the commission um, published after the the receiving um, the responses, they in this what they call the the world's largest uh, accessibility test, we saw that there was still uh, very few websites and mobile applications considering um, full accessibility. But going beyond that, in our response, we highlighted this flaws in the legislation that we uh, we knew they were not um, they were not good uh, when the legislation was adopted and it, it was actually proven by the pandemic um, that these exemptions which unfortunately certain member states in their national laws tend uh, focus very much on those on the exceptions and how to understand them and so forth rather than on how we can overcome them and how we can implement the legislation um, in its entirety uh, we saw that uh, these exceptions uh, as for um, for example public broadcasting uh, was uh, was not good uh, as during the pandemic, many people turned to these uh, broadcasting websites uh, to, to find information and say would go for other exceptions, um, such as the, the exclusion of um, NGOs, um, which are not providing essential services for persons with disabilities. All of this wording was a bit vague and created many, many uh, confusion at national level. And therefore, we, we thought, OK, um, what about those NGOs providing essential services to all citizens, such as, for example, NGOs providing um, support to women victims of uh, violence, for example. Then um, another exception which created uh, problems at national level was the exclusion of intranets and extranets. Um, 
um, nurseries, kindergartens, schools, all of these, if we think of the, um, the, 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 long, the, the dark lockdown um, years, it was absolutely necessary that these services would be uh, would have been accessible to persons with disabilities as well. So we hope that in the in the conclusions of this evaluation of the of the directive, the Commission realized and, and member states realized that uh, uh, they should um, have a more inclusive approach to cover all public sector. And in a future revised legislation, we could overcome this kind of. Um, uh, essential services that were that were not covered by by the by the legislation. Um, beyond that, um, I would like also to 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 highlight that the what um, June mentioned about the lack of accessible um, of accessibility professional accessibility expertise in the public sector. This is also that concerns. Uh, us very much because we feel that even though the directive had a very positive effect in many EU countries by first of all in some of them by having for the first time accessibility legislation in this regard but now to really make the the, the push internally to invest more on accessibility and we believe that the hiring of accessibility professionals in the public sector could also be a really good opportunity for persons with disabilities to work in the public sector. And this is why we believe that in the future, uh, in a revised um, web accessibility directive, authoring tools, which are the tools that web editors uh, use uh, when developing and, and adding content uh, to, the, to the website, should also be covered by the legislation. And therefore, we will have um, more accessible authoring tools and therefore the possibility for persons with disabilities to uh, work in the public sector as web editors and, and so forth. In the end, the, the, the public sector is becoming more and more digital as well. And therefore having this will hopefully create a spillover effect uh, internally and will also uh, ensure that the governments comply with the obligations of public procurement legislation because um, there was since 2014 the obligation to buy um, accessible products and services in the public sector to take to get to take into account accessibility in the technical specifications but unfortunately uh, this this is not always the case and it did not happen as for um, many member states in many procurement processes this is not only uh, the public procurement angle there is also the anti-discrimination angle in the eu since unfortunately we don't have an anti-discrimination legislation for persons with disabilities in all aspects of life but we do have a directive uh, from 20, uh, from 2000 on equal treatment in employment and having a more accessible and inclusive uh, public sector digitally uh, would also ensure that persons with disabilities can uh, join the public sector as public servants and this would be very much in line with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So we have all these expectations as for the future web directive that we don't know yet, but we do really need to, to focus on ensuring that um, the current directive is well understood and well implemented at national level, that there is a better involvement of persons with disabilities in monitoring of the legislation. Unfortunately, in many cases, this is not possible because of lack of resources. So if public sectors, uh, sector bodies, uh, well, if public national governments want to involve persons with disabilities, they should ensure as well that they have the means to, to actually uh, being able to, to contribute meaningfully, because it's not the same to just drop an email, hey, what do you think of this? Or do you want, uh, do you need to be involved in the, in the monitoring process, uh, come over, spend so much hours uh, with us and so forth? We need to really really ensure at national level uh, processes that improve uh, the meaningful participation in the implementation and the monitoring of this, um, this legislation. So I would like to, to extend a little uh, so, so long. So I would just mention that in at EDF, we are part of, um, of an EU funded project um, focused on the web accessibility directive is called Why 
Coop, uh, it's in collaboration with academia, with industry, with uh, W3C, the Web Accessibility Initiative, and it's about creating communities of practice around the Web Accessibility Directive. It's about bringing all the knowledge, all the resources together to be aware of technological developments and also to create a kind of um, uh, resource center as for the web uh, directive. You can find, uh, my colleague will share it in the chat, um, um, frequently asked uh, questions about the web directive. So if you have any doubt about the, the what, the web directive, please go there and check the, the, the questions or you can also write to the help desk and uh, we will provide with all the information uh, you may need. So I will leave it there and thank you so much uh, IWP again and uh, for organizing with us this uh, important event, this important celebration. Thank you all the accessibility experts that are present today, all the disability advocates here as well, and all of you for being here and for helping us to improve digital accessibility for persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. Back to you, Susanna. Thank you, Alejandro. That was a lot, a long Sorry. list. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it, it was fine. And everything, everything you say is always um, extremely important. It's just hard to, to kind of pick one thing that I think is most important of this. But, but many good thoughts and ideas and then a long wish list for the Commission to do, to do even better in the future, as always. So we have some questions already, but I will uh, turn over to Marlin from Norway uh, and take the questions in the end. So... Being outside of the EU, our dear neighbors have had legislation on web accessibility or universal design, as they prefer to call it, since 2010, covering both private and public sector in what is clearly the most ambitious and far-reaching accessibility law on the continent. And in 2023, they are going to add the EU legislation to the mix. So I'm very pleased to introduce Marlin Rygg, who is the director of the department at the a Norwegian monitoring agency called the Authority for Universal Design of ICT at the Norwegian Digitalization Agency. I think I got that right. <laughs> Big deal is the short <laughs> question. <laughs> so please, Malin, let us know what is happening in Norway. This is super exciting. Well, first of all, a happy anniversary. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Susanna, the, the web directive is not uh, fully implemented in Norway yet. So um, we, we have in effect our regulation from 2013, but we are still in the process of implementing the web directive. So this is not an ideal situation uh, for me as head of an authority for this anniversary to come to talk to you and just have to say that we are not still <laughs> uh, fully implemented with the directive, but we are getting closer. And one of the uh, benefits for me is that I'm in the fortunate position of, of being able to observe and learn from you all <laughs> that have already started your journey with the web directive. So uh, that for me at least is a very uh, positive uh, perspective and we are looking forward to implementing it in 2023. So it's been two exciting years. Uh, we've been uh, cooperating and having dialogue with a lot of our neighbors in this period. So we know a lot about the work you've been doing and we've also looked at the reports that you've been submitting. So we are very impressed with all the good work that's been done uh, during this time. And with the pandemic, as mentioned, we have uh, all, I think, become more aware of the importance of accessible digital information and services, maybe especially within the workforce and the uh, education sector. So I think uh, more than ever, we see that accessibility is necessary to succeed with digitization. And if we are as a society to reap the full benefits of this, both for the individual, but also as a society as a whole, I think it's very important uh, that we succeed with this uh, accessibility legislation. So uh, as uh, mentioned uh, from the EU, EU Commission, uh, it also aligns with the UN Sustainability Development Goals. And I think it's very important to connect what is now being done with the legislation in EU and uh, the Sustainability uh, Development Goals. 
because what we are doing is uh, building a society that is good and equal for everybody. So uh, I thought it was very good for over her to mention that. So anyway, I, I thought I'd start a bit about just uh, letting you all know uh, about the regulation that we have had in place since 2013 in Norway. Uh, it, it is the requirements in the uh, WCAG, the, uh, the VCAG uh, 2.0 for website, apps, and then for self-serving machines, which have other standards, but also regulate accessibility. Uh, in Norway, the regulation are put in place for both private and public sector and also for non-profit organization. So the scope is very wide. Uh, it was the 35 VCAG 2OA and AA success criteria that were put in place. Uh, and we have so far uh, have uh, not had uh, the advantage of very much automated controls. So our controls have been very much manual. So I will say a bit about that, but our, uh, our approach has been risk-based. Uh, what that means is that we have targeted our controls towards solutions that have many uses that are important or crucial to individuals' rights to participate in society. Um, and I thought that might, might be, or I say something about our um, experiences so far. Uh, in the years since 2013, we've uh, done two bigger surveys. Uh, the results were all over, of course, a big variety amongst private and public sector bodies, uh, but the overall results were a compliance about 60%. Uh, it is enhancing uh, over the years, but I think still it's fairly low since the requirements are minimum. So a 60% overall compliance is just telling us that um, the situation is, well, it's not where we want to be. Uh, and since 2014, we've conducted 51 inspections. For those who are not familiar with uh, the Norwegian law, I can say it can in some ways be compared to the in-depth audits that you are now conducting with the web directive. So we've done 51 inspections, both with public and private sector, uh, and the results are 96% of the solutions that we test were non-compliant. So again, the picture is very uh, in consistency with what Alejandro was uh, saying, that uh, the solutions as now, as of now, are not uh, good enough uh, to ensure equal participation. So, uh, and just to mention, in 2020, we asked users with different, usabil uh, different disabilities uh, how uh, they find digital solution and if they find their impairment to be some hindrance uh, in using digital solutions. And 70% says yes. Um, also, what we've seen the last year is that the individual complaints are on the rise. And this is uh, one thing that I find very positive with the directive that uh, we now um, get the feedback mechanism. So uh, the feedback mechanism, I think, will uh, ensure even more individual complaints. Uh, but of this year, we have tested 40 solutions as a result of individual complaints, and only two were compliant. So. Uh, yes, it underlines the point that we have still a way uh, to go. So when the web directive uh, comes into force next year for us, uh, this is the first time we will have different uh, requirements for public and private sector, more requirements for the public sector then. Um, and we are to uh, issue our first report in 2024. So <laughs> we are now uh, preparing for our monitoring, which we have to start next year. Uh, while we were waiting uh, to get uh, started, we have uh, developed a mandatory solution for the accessibility statement. In Norway, we've chosen to make this as a solution that we as um, authority has developed and where everybody uh, uses or everybody uses it to make their accessibility statement. 
the the aim is to make it easier for the users they they find the same user interface for every accessibility statement it's easier for the public sector bodies they uh, we have already invented the wheel to, so to speak they don't have to uh, make this themselves and it's also an important data source for us to control uh, all uh, the accessibility statements so we have uh, made an interface with based on the principal guidelines and success criteria of the VCAG, and we've added guidance so that we will make it safe and easy for the bodies to use uh, this uh, solution. But still, of course, uh, they will have uh, to test it uh, in ad advance. Uh, as uh, Alejandro mentioned, it's of course uh, a lack of experts, but we've tried to publish our test procedures on our website so that uh, we can help people test themselves. They can use tools or, of course, uh, hire an expert or a combination. Uh, the aim is, of course, that uh, when everybody by 1st of February 2023, uh, due to have their accessibility statement published, we can be able to control it and also guide them to use the accessibility st uh, statement to do better and to raise awareness. It was mentioned that awareness is on the rise and we, we find that too, but they are still too low to, uh, or what I consider too low uh, to ensure the equal participation all over. Um, yes, so uh, just uh, just um, in the finish, uh, we are also preparing for the monitoring effort. We have had so much uh, good dialogue with especially our Nordic colleagues, but also other countries in the EU. And as mentioned, I'm very impressed with all the really good work that's been doing. It's been done uh, and it's a valuable input when we are now preparing our own monitoring. So we've started our preparations and we're looking into digital tools of how to do this. We want, of course, the most automated, possible, simplified um, uh, monitoring. Uh, and we are also putting in place data, data platform uh, and other tools to make uh, our monitoring as data driven and digitized as possible so that our reach can be as far reaching as, as we can possibly become. So again, I just want to say happy anniversary and thank you. And I hope uh, if anybody has questions or want some dialogue or share their experience with us, that they don't hesitate to, to contact us. So thank you so much, Susanna. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, that was very interesting. Always good to hear from, from Norway. We are so close, but still so far away sometimes. <laughs> but it will be good when you kind of enter the family of the Web Accessibility Directive. So next year we can kind of you will catch up so, um, fast, I'm sure. So we did have a, a couple of questions. So my first question will be for Alejandro. Um, what would you say is the most positive thing that member states are doing with regards to implementation of the Web? So one one thing so that we can have more questions answered <laughs> one thing is to mm -hmm. set up the internal processes um to make their websites more accessible i think that's that's the key to have the professionals to invest on it that's 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 part of the process yeah yeah, yeah I, I agree that's a, that's a good answer what would you say marlin what would even if the question was posed to alejandro i mean in in your experience in norway what would be the most positive or important thing for the subjects of of the legislation to do if they can only do one thing <laughs> <laughs> I, I i talk now warmly about the integrated accessibility that you have to integrate it in your processes in your internal control process and that you have to kind of make it uh, something you work with all, with all through your system not only as one thing but that also your managers your designers your publishers everything within your organization have this in their routines and in their system. I think that is yeah. the one thing, <laughs> a big so thing, but the one thing. <laughs> yeah, so it becomes kind of part of the daily life. So you're you're both in the same same uh, idea here that the process. So it's not kind of a. I thought I think maybe uh, people are sometimes looking for kind of test this or do that, but but I agree. Mm -hmm. It's usually kind of a more overarching 
Yeah. In, in, sorry, no, no, just to, to complement. In this regard, we always talk about the European standard EN 301, 549, our dear standard for ICT accessibility. But there was also another interesting standard that was adopted not so long ago. And um, we tend to, to neglect it a bit, but it's also very useful to, to incorporate these internal processes uh, and, and to incorporate a universal design approach in any kind of organization, also the, the, um, the public sector. And this is the European standard EN 17161 on accessibility following a design for all approach. That standard kind of guides any organization to incorporate these internal processes to have better accessibility outcomes. That could be useful as well for the public sector. Mm -hmm. So we have got a question about if the how um, whether the EU will provide ready to use open source tools available for all to check and monitor accessibility. And the EU, uh, the European Commission is not here to answer that question, but I, I don't know any of those plans. Do you, Alejandro, do you think they will do no. that? I don't know either, sorry. No, so. So I think uh, at least during the transposition where I was working closely with the member states and the, uh, and the commission, uh, the idea was to kind of leave it to the market and but that can of course change so I can't say what the commission will do in the future but but as for now I don't think that is really on the on the horizon uh, for now. So uh, another question, this is from Marlin, isn't it very expensive to have two different levels of requirements running in parallel, one for public and one another for private? I guess it's the testing procedure. Uh, well, that remains to be seen. Uh, we, we hope it should not be uh, more expensive, really, because uh, I think uh, public sector is in the front is front runners for accessibility in Norway. And I think they are ready for some more <laughs> requirements. And I just hope really that private sector will follow also through guidance or best practices uh, to do more than the 35. So, um, yes, I. I I think this is, um, yeah, I think this is uh, manageable, doable. Okay, and you, you also have all the oil money, so <laughs> <laughs> if somebody has the money, it's always you. Sorry, <laughs> that says the Swede, I'm just, I'm just envious, so that's, that's clear, it's kind of the neighbor thing we have. So, and another question for you, Marlon, is could you give an example of what you have looked at in the private sector? Is it solutions mm -hmm. that serves the public sector? Well, we've uh, done a different kinds of, uh, of uh, solutions, but uh, the most famous one is the SAS, the airline in 2017. Uh, then we've seen looked at the banking sector and also uh, different transport uh, solutions, both apps and, and also payment, uh, different payment. We have like this mobile payment app, for instance. So we've looked at different kinds of solutions that I think is fairly important too for the daily life of people although they're not public um, services okay so and for alejandro how uh, you mentioned that uh, the inclusion or involvement of, of end users with disabilities is important but how how is that going to be improved how, do you have any tips for the i don't know if this is industry or public sector but but in general how can we make sure that end users are better involved in in this whole process that's um, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, in my intervention, I kind of throw some ideas, but uh, there obviously it really depends on the context, uh, so on the member states. But I would say that in many cases, the um, uh, we obviously follow the nothing about us without us, and we try to embed this in in all the legislation we work on. This is one example, but then the reality in member states differs um, and therefore the member states if they really want a meaningful involvement of persons with disabilities and they should because it's proven that when we are involved the the results are better um, then they should provide the tools the resources to do so um, so just making a bro like an open call to come and get involved uh, spend your two days testing websites for us or things like that it will not work. So the government should have a clear 
uh, plan and, and resources to, to fund the, the meaningful participation of persons with disabilities and the representative organization. And at the same time, from our end, DPOs, we should also reach out to, to experts, to, to accessibility experts, to academia, to really equip ourselves also with the knowledge to be as, you know, as impactful as possible. So it goes both ways, but uh, just calling for involvement and do nothing about ensuring it is 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 nonsense so really put your how how is that expression in english put your uh, money where your mouth is something like that so kind of uh, that but applied to to the involvement in policy making and monitoring yeah true so how, so marlin i can let you ask answer that as well how do you involve users in a good way or have you seen any good examples of that in norway Absolutely, we've seen good examples and there are bodies that are working very uh, good with this, uh, but of course I think this is so to the point from Alejandro, we need more end users both in uh, when we do our work in the, as a, the authority or in the government, also within the bodies or, or out with the, the work that is being done with the both public and private sector. So we have some front runners that are really good at it, but there are few <laughs> and often big uh, companies. So we need to make it more easy for, for also other companies to, to use end user testing more. So. Yes. And, and my kind of take on that is uh, the end users are the experts, so pay them as experts. That's kind of also something we see, unfortunately, too often that, that end users are even when they are involved, they are not paid as experts. So that's, I think is a bit disturbing for me at least. So we got a question about the standards um, that you mentioned, um, Alejandro. So uh, it's the EM301549 is the accessibility standard for products and services. And then it's the 171, EN17161 is the design for all. That's more of a pro process standard, if you will. Yeah. And then it's the 172. 210 is the built environment standard. And then we're also going to develop new standards. So there will be a whole list of long uh, numbers to remember, but we have we have a session on, on the um, standards. I see I, I get more questions about standards, but we will come to that uh, later today because we have a whole session uh, talking about that. So, but, but thank I you. I love standards. <laughs> yeah. We all love standards. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And the numbering of the standards. That's really interesting. So. Uh, there was also a question, so why is this, um, so <laughs> is there a common approach between countries on a possible common mandatory accessibility statement? Interesting the Norwegian approach in this respect. So is there a common approach between countries on a possible common mandatory accessibility statement? Well, the answer to that is yes, there is in the um, European, uh, in the Web Accessibility Directive, there is a, a what is called an implementing act that has a template for the accessibility statement. So that is how it should be done uh, in, in Europe. And then there are also other initiatives and tools and, and organizations that try to provide or that provides um, automatic tools to create uh, statements that, that follow the um, the templates, but of course, they even if there is a template, the member states uh, do it slightly different. But the idea is that it should be the same. Um, so, and I don't know what the the Norwegian approach in this respect was. Just I think that was just a th thumbs up to Norway <laughs> for for your approach on accessibility statements. So, uh, with this, I think we have to wrap up this uh, first uh, short session. Thank you very much, Alejandro and Marlin, for sharing your thoughts and experiences uh, with all of us and for kind of kicking off the celebrations. Uh, I hope that next year, I've heard that the third, 23rd of September is a Saturday next year, so we'll have to maybe move the date, but, but I really hope that we can do that then, a face-to-face -face meeting so that we can celebrate with cake or champagne or, or whatever we want to, to celebrate with, but, but this feel, feels like we, we need to meet more often than, than we have done in the last couple of years. So thank you very much, and we'll move into the next thank you. session.